to the platform Swiss Liver Patients Association, Swiss HEPA. Today, with the presentation from Professor Dr. Stefan Wawrika with the topic Primary Sclerosing Cholangitis. Welcome, Professor Wawrika. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Um, within the next 15 minutes or so, we will discuss the primary sclerosing cholangitis. My name is Stefan Wawrika. I'm a gastroenterologist based in Zurich, Switzerland. Perhaps what points do I want to discuss with you? We first will go a little bit through the general history of patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis. We will discuss a little bit epidemiology. In the second point, we will discuss what clinical symptoms do patients have with primary sclerosing cholangitis? What are diagnostic steps? Then I will just mention that PSC is quite often associated with inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, and with malignancy, and we will then discuss therapy options and what's a good strategy to do a surveillance in those patients. So general considerations about PSC. PSC is a chronic autoimmune liver disease. It usually goes together with inflammation of the bile ducts, meaning the bile ducts are chronically inflamed. And wherever in the body you have a chronic inflammation, you have a higher risk of developing a cancer. The causes of PSC are unclear. We know that it's influenced by genetic factors, environmental factors. Somehow your immune system plays a, an important role, but what really is the cause of primary sclerosis and cholangitis is un, unclear at the present time. But what, it, it, what is clear with PSC is that you have an inflammation. Wherever you have an inflammation, you have a scarring process, a fibrosis, and this scarring process then can lead to a premalignant or a malignant lesion, meaning that you can develop a cancer in an inflamed uh, region. As I said, it can be associated with, with inflammatory bowel disease, especially with ulcerative colitis. So up till 70 to 80% of patients with PSC have an underlying ulcerative colitis. It's also increased with certain cancers, especially in the bile ducts, in the gallbladder, and in the large intestine. And there is currently no proven therapy apart from liver transplantation. Um, a little bit more men are um, affected than women, 60% men, 40% women. The median age at diagnosis is 40 years. The incidence is about 6 to 16 per 100,000 inhabitants. And at the moment, it, the, the incidence is increasing. And also increased familiar risk is, is known. So if it's in the family, you have a higher risk of developing a PSC. What are clinical presentations? So 50% of patients have no symptoms at diagnosis. And um, I'm sorry, it's, it's in German, but I will translate. So 50% have no symptoms. Um, about half of the patients have fatigue. Half till 70% of patients have um, itching, pruritus. Um, up till 69% of patients have a yellow skin, which is called icterus. Um, a lot of patients have abdominal pain, weight loss, fever, and uh, hyperpigmentation, meaning that the skin develops a little bit like a brownish character. What laboratory parameters can you look at? So on one hand, you have a bile duct, parameters and liver parameters, and those two parameters can be increased. So on one hand, if the bile duct parameters are increased, you call that cholestasis. And one of those parameters is called alkaline phosphatase. And the alkaline phosphatase usually shows a three to five time um, times um, upper limit of normal. Liver function tests are increased and often at the di diagnosis bilirubin is not increased, but within the course of the disease bilirubin can be increased. You also have some specific autoantibodies on one hand P-ANCA, IgG, and ANA, which can be elevated, but not really uh, always. 
you might also know that primary biliary cholangitis is a little bit associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis. So PBC and PSC are a little bit like twins, but are not so, not exactly the same. And um, if you want to exclude the PBC, you can measure an autoantibody, which is called AMA. And if AMA is negative, then this excludes PBC and the chance that you have a PSC is, is then higher. You can use imaging techniques. Sonography is not so good, but you can uh, use MRCP. Um, imaging, the MRCP is the imaging of the first choice. The good thing about it is it's non-invasive, you have no radiation, and you see here a picture of such an MRCP, so you can really uh, show the whole bile ducts and you can show whether within those bile ducts you see some like uh, uh, fibrosing or stenosing processes called strictures. Another a way of showing those bile ducts is by doing a gastroscopy. And within the gastroscopy, it's called the ERCP. You can put in a small catheter into the bile duct, which is down here. And if you, if you put in some contrast media, then you see the bile duct. And as you can see here, it looks a little bit like pearls on a string. So you have like a lot of fibrosis here. So different parts where the bile ducts are inflamed and show like this, these strictures. And the good thing about ERCP is it can be used to open up those strictures. So if you have a stenosis within the bile duct that can be treated by, for example, putting in a metal stand. The good thing about it, it's also good if you, because you can take biopsies. And in some patients, MRCP is not possible, especially if those patients have metal in themselves, then you shouldn't use an MRCP. You can also use liver biopsy. It's not standard. So what you can find is that you have something which is called the onion skin. So this is like a bile duct and around the bile duct, you see this onion skin lesions. You don't find that in all patients, only in 25% of patients, but that's also something which you can do to, to look at whether patients have PSC or not. As mentioned, PSC can be associated with inflammatory bowel diseases. And if you have a patient who has PSC, the chance of having at the same time an inflammatory bowel disease is somewhere between 60 to 80 percent, so it's quite high. And this means that in every patient which has been newly diagnosed with PSC, you should do at least one colonoscopy to rule out the possibility that the patient has an inflammatory bowel disease. So ulcerative colitis is much more prevalent than Crohn's disease, but also Crohn's disease can appear in patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis. On the other hand, if you look at all IBD patients, and if you look how often do IBD patients develop primary sclerosis and cholangitis. It's a little bit lower. The reason for that is that there are much more IBD patients around than PSC patients around. So in IBD patients, the prevalence of PSC is only 3 to 10%. If you are a PSC patient, the chance of you having also IBD at the same time is quite high. As mentioned, primary sclerosis and cholangitis can go together with malignancy. Wherever you have a, an inflammation, you also tend to have a malignancy. And I want to show you this slide. So PSC can be associated with inflammatory bowel disease. PSC can be asymptomatic. Inflammatory bowel disease by itself has an increased risk of developing a colon cancer. However, if you have the combination of PSC and inflammatory bowel disease, the chance of developing a colon cancer is much, much higher. And therefore, we suggest if patients have the combination of both diseases, that you perform once per year a colonoscopy to rule out colon cancer. Patients with PSC can develop a liver cirrhosis, so a scarring of the liver. And whenever you have a liver cirrhosis, this can in, in turn then lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. So in patients with PSC, you have to be careful to also monitor whether those patients develop a hepatocellular carcinoma. Patients with PSC also tend to have bile duct cancer. The chance is much, much higher. Bile duct cancer by itself is not something which appears often. So uh, 161 
times higher incidence rate seems quite high, but for something which is not so often, it's it's not that much increase. Nevertheless, we think that PSC patients should undergo a regular uh, surveillance regarding bile duct cancer and also pancreatic cancer can be uh, a problem in PSC patients. And therefore, it's also important to keep in mind that one of the therapy options for PSC patients is liver transplantation. And this is something which appears usually after 10 to 20 or even 30 years of disease course. So what is the therapy? You can use ursodeoxycholic acid. This is something which has been first found in Chinese black bears at high concentrations. And it has been shown that this ursodeoxycholic acid in those black bears, um, that those, those bears, they don't develop um, gold, gold, um, gold bladder stones that often and don't develop that often uh, inflammation within the gall uh, bile ducts. So if you um, take a ursodeoxycholic acid, this binds to total bile acids, and this in turn probably decreases the probability of developing an inflammation. So at the moment, perhaps also uh, ursodeoxycholic acid, at the moment there aren't so many good um, publications showing that it really shows a benefit. Nevertheless, it's quite often used in therapy of PSC. So it has, thankfully, it has not so much side effects. And therefore, if I would be a PSC patient, I would, I would take uh, ursodeoxycholic acid, although knowing that there is not like a perfect publication record. So we don't have that many good publications showing a positive effect. There are a lot of new therapies coming the way. So obeticholic acid is one of those. This is a compound which binds ferrocenide X receptor, and this in turn is antifibrotic. So you can perhaps uh, prevent scarring. There is a monoclonal antibody called Sintuzumab, which can be used in such, a, such an instant. You can use oral antibiotics such as vancomycin, which changes the, the, the intestinal microbiome. And it has been shown that by changing the intestinal microbiome, this might have a positive effect also on scarring in PSC patients. And uh, fecal microbial transfer is also something which will be looked at in several studies coming the way. So though we only have pilot studies for fecal microbial transfer. So this is a therapy which I wouldn't um, consider at the moment, but this will be perhaps something which we will consider in future. And there is the 24-NOR ursodeoxycholic acid, which has an anti-inflammatory effect, an antifibrotic effect. And this can probably also, or hopefully, it can prevent patients with PSC to develop other scarring tissue. As I have said, PSC is often associated with itching, and itching is quite a big problem in patients with PSC, and we have like a stepwise approach where we first start with cholestyramine, with rifampicin, we then change to naltrexone, sertraline, or we even evaluate patients for liver transplantation. So if you have, if you are a PSC patient and you have itching, then you have quite a lot of different treatment options. Talk to your doctor and ask him what what could be the next therapeutic steps. You can also use antihistamines. There are not so many good studies for antihistamines. The good thing about antihistamines, if you use those which are sedative, then you can use them at bedtime, meaning that patients with itching sleep better during the night and they don't wake up that often because of the itching. And what surveillance do we suggest patients? And I will show you this slide, which is from the University Hospital of Zurich. That's where I did my training. That's why I'm showing you what, what we did there. So um, we usually do in patients with PSC once to twice a year um, liver function tests and those cholestatic parameters, which I have shown you, the alkaline phosphatase and the bilirubin. We look for a certain tumor marker. One is called CA99. We do that once a year. We do an abdominal ultrasound 
where we especially look at, um, at the gallbladder once a year and we do MRCP, this special MRI technique to look at the bile ducts also once a year. We usually do it every six months we do something. So we do uh, abdominal sonography after six months, we do MRCP after six months again, abdominal sonography and so, so on. If we see within the MRCP somewhere a really uh, tight structure, then we do, we, we perform an ERCP where you can like take biopsies, look whether this is something malignant and where you can even treat this, um, this narrowing of the bile ducts. And in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and PSC, we do once a year a colonoscopy. And if you have a PSC without a, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, you do a colonoscopy every five years. And you should also keep in mind that patients with PSC tend to have an osteoporosis. That's why you should do uh, osteodensitometry in a regular fashion to exclude that patients have osteoporosis. And with that having said, I thank you for your attention. Many thanks for the instructive and exciting presentation of Professor Dr. Wawrika and your great personal commitment. Thank you very much.